Hello, it's that time again when you've fired up your podcast provider to listen to the latest instalment of the official AFC Bournemouth podcast, bringing you extended chats about our guests' lives, times and Cherry's careers and connections. We're back amongst the club's coaching staff for our pod today. But before we get into that, Neil Perrett is here once again, AFCB club journalist. Neil, we're, we're at the end of the season now, which means you're not going to get to see me twice a week at matches for a while. Are you going to be OK with that? I'm going to be absolutely fine, Chris. I've got a picture of you dressed as... Elvis Presley that I can always look at. It was the time you said that there was no chance of Eddie Howe coming back as manager. And if he did, you'd dress up as Elvis to commentate on a game. Do you remember that? I do remember a very chilly Tuesday night against Shrewsbury. I think it was 1-0. And Eddie didn't even come up for the post-match interview after all that, that day. But yes, that unfortunately, that photo does keep resurfacing. But thanks for reminding us anyway. Uh, let's bring in today's guest. Enough of that nonsense, shall we? As I said, we're returning to the club's coaching hierarchy today. And a man who's been no stranger to leading his team to silverware as a coach recently. He also played 240 times for the Cherries during a seven-year stint, many of them as captain. It's a delight to welcome to the pod the club's under-21 coach, Sean Cooper. How are you, Sean? All good, thanks, Chris. Good, good to have you with us. Um, we're going to be focusing particularly as the uh, the Cherries, of course, are preparing to face Brentford in the Championship playoffs over the next week or so. The main topic of this podcast will be look back 10 years to the time uh, the club last made the playoffs in a very eventful 2010-11 season. But before we get into that, a quick reflection for you on what's been a great couple of weeks for you and your, your under-21 squad. Uh, yeah, um, I'm pretty sure everyone's aware of how the Eastley game unfolded. Obviously, with Trav's coming up, scoring the... Uh, the late equaliser. So, yeah, good two weeks for us. In terms of that, I mean, silverware at your level, I know the fixture con the fixture schedule has been a little bit truncated because of COVID and, and various issues as well. But when you've got something meaningful at the end of the season to, to aim for, the Central League Cup, you obviously won at, at St George's Park. And that beyond the trophy, that looked to be a great experience for, for your guys training at that facility as well. Yeah, it was. Um, you know, being, being where England trained, the lads were buzzing when we got up there. Uh, the changing room was fantastic. It was the best, biggest changing room I've ever been in. Uh, so the whole experience was really good. Um, so yeah, it was, a, it was a good day. And you were able to call on, as you said, Mark Travers scoring a goal against, uh, against Eastley and Gavin Kilkenny and a couple of other lads you've had first team as well. How nice for them, having been on the fringes of the first team for a lot of the season and spent a lot of bench time for the first team to, to really be contributing to something? Yeah, for all the boys, I think the one thing they miss uh, with our games programme is the competitive side, playing for something. Um, that's not to say they aren't competitive. They play to win every time they play. But as you say, to, to end it playing for a trophy and then to win the trophy for all of them was uh, was fantastic. We'll come a lot more onto your current role and, and your uh, yeah, your coaching career and your hopes for the future as well, a little bit later on in the uh, the podcast. But let's take it back 10 years then. First of all, how good your memory? How good yeah. does that 2010-11 season stick in your mind? Uh, well, um, the first thing that jumps out is the playoffs. Uh, and the second thing that jumps out is, uh, for me, Plymouth away, uh, when we won somehow. Uh, it was a Jason Pierce show, I think. We were under the cosh for the whole game and he was outstanding. Somehow we managed to, to nick a win. So those two things jump straight to the front of my mind. Well, let's dig into a bit more forensic detail on this with the help of Neil, who's done some, uh, some great research to dig out some of the memories of, of that season uh, 10 years ago. Um, first of all, you had to work pretty hard on your fitness. Having, having got back in March 2010, you were out for 11 months with a hip problem. Yeah, I was. Um, I played through the great escape season with a, with a hip issue, uh, and then I had to have an operation in the summer. And I managed to, to nick a few appearances at the tail end of the promotion year, which, which was nice. Um, but yeah, you know, I think from that point on, I always had a struggle with injury. So, I, you know, along with everybody at the time, we were all playing bandaged up, um, as is the case at most clubs, really. But uh, yeah, it was just, you know, I actually look back and see how many appearances I played in the 2010-11 se season. I was quite surprised I played that many because I just felt like I was always getting niggles. But uh, credit to the physio, Steve Hard at the time, uh, he managed to wrap me up and get me out there. He's wrapped a lot of players up over the last <laughs> 10 years, hasn't he, since, since he's been here, Steve. Um, was there ever a concern during that long injury layoff that you might might not get back to the same level? <sighs> Did I ever get back to that level? I don't know. What was that <laughs> level? Um, High. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there was always the concern. Um, you know, it's not nice. I'm sure so many people, and there's more people who've probably sat in this seat and told you stories about when they were injured. Um, and it's not nice. You do have concerns. You start getting anxious about what if this is it? Uh, what am I going to do? Um, and you know all of those things weighing on your mind. You then got to go out and play. So so it, it's tough. But one thing I'll say, and, and you know I'm sure we'll speak about Brad as a bit later. I do remember um, Leighton Orient away 
I'd really struggled with injury and, and I was in that mindset of, am I ever going to get fit enough to carry on playing or am I going to have to call it a day? And uh, I'd had a joke and a laugh with Harry Arter the day before. I said something not very offensive to him and him being the type of character he was just shot me down with whatever coops, you won't even last half hour tomorrow, uh, being the type that he was. And I think it was 27 minutes I lasted. So for, uh, for him, I'm sure, I'm sure it was funny, but uh, you know, I, I was in a real, I was struggling. And so I came off, sat down and it got, it got the better of me. So I had to go in, into the dressing room because I started crying, I was in tears. That's how, that's how much I was struggling with it. And, and um, I remember Lee Bradbury was on the bench and he came in and put his arm around me and said some nice things. So I'll never forget that. You know, when you are a player, and you, you know, players breaking down in tears, it, it takes quite a bit to to admit that kind of thing because it's a uh, you know the masculine dressing room and things of a of a, a first team squad is a tough place <laughs> to be at times. Yeah. Um, well, on the flip side of that, I've seen other people as well break down. Um, and having remembered what it meant when Bradders came and spoke to me, uh, you know, I, I you know I spoke to these lads. Some of them were young lads, and um, you know, that's all you've ever done, whatever age you are as a player. All you've ever done is play football. So. Uh, to worry that it's coming to an end, you know, is, you know, it's not, it's not nice. The start of that season, um, there were three new signings in the 10-11 season. One of them you've already mentioned, Harry Arter. The question was going to be, what were your first impressions of him? But I think we just got <laughs> an idea of, you soon got to know what Harry Arter was like. Mark Pugh and, and Michael Symes as well arrived to, to give the squad a bit of a boost that season. Yeah, I mean, they're all very good players. I, you know, with Harry Arter, I remember seeing him in training. He'd come from non-league. So uh, my ignorance at the time, I didn't realise quite, the level of ability that there was in non-league. So he come up and he trained with us. And um, I didn't think much of him when I first saw him. He was short lad with long hair. Um, he was quiet, obviously, because he didn't know anyone. But then we started training and uh, he was very ratty. If he closed you down with the ball, you had to offload it quickly because he'd tackle you. I'm trying to press him and he's using his left foot, his right foot. I'm thinking, I don't know what foot this kid is. I couldn't get near him. so. I was impressed on the first day of training, for sure. Sean, the, the season started well with a bang, certainly for Brett Pittman. He got a hat-trick in a 5-1 home win against Peterborough here. But days later, he got sold to Bristol City. What, what was the mood in the camp that you'd lost your goal-scoring talisman so soon into that season? Um, it wasn't a surprise. Um, we suspected it may happen. But yeah, you lose Brett, you lose goals. Uh, so it was a question of uh, where are they going to come from? which as the season went on, we obviously had good players that were up and coming who managed to, to, to score goals for us. But yeah, obviously he scored a hat-trick, deserved his move. And um, that, that was the main thing, where our goal's going to come from. Just expand a little bit on what's it like to play uh, with Brett in your team? Because when I look back at the greatest escape and the promotion the following season and where the club is now, you, you could argue that the club potentially might not have been here had it not been for all those goals. No, I I don't think you could ever overstate the importance of Brett Pittman to this football club. But I think, you know, he's arguably the most important player with in terms of individual contributions. Um, his goal record's phenomenal. Uh, he's certainly the best finisher I ever played with. Um, but I think particularly in his early days, it was, it was, you had to take the bad with the good with him. Not so, so much the bad, but he was never going to be the type to sprint around and set off a press for you. But if you gave him an opportunity, he would score you a goal. It was that simple. We all knew it. He knew it. And eventually Eddie knew it as a manager, which is why he always played him and got the best out of him. Uh, we just had to serve it up for him and he'd go and finish off the attack. So, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a priceless quality to have. Josh McCoy was the man tasked to fill the void after Brett had gone to, to Bristol City. He certainly stepped up to the plate. But he got back-to-back -back hat tricks in November, one in the cup, joined Millwall on loan, and then he was gone as well. That was probably a sign of the financial times at the, at the club then. Yeah, um, you know, that, as you know, that's how the club worked back then. Um, he come in and he was on fire. We knew Josh was quick. He'd predominantly been a wide man, um, I think, for the youth team. And then he come in and he started playing up front for us, and he he's had blistering pace. And, you know, back-to-back -back hat tricks. He was ruthless in front of goal. So it's no surprise that there was a tension and that he ended up leaving. Um, the club weren't in a position really to keep hold of anyone if anything elsewhere came about. So, um, 
yeah, there's another one who it happened quickly but deserved his move. The baton then got handed to Danny Ings, who'd only turned 18 in the summer and he'd only played one game previously when he was picked to start in a 2-0 defeat at Milton Keynes Dons in December. What what did you make of a teenage Danny Ings? Well, Ings, he was a very confident lad. Very confident, I think. Anyone who's ever met him will know that. But he was really grounded as well. He was hardworking. He, he had bags of skill. I remember training against him. He was really sharp. Couldn't get near him. He'd drop a shoulder. He was jinky. He was energetic. Um, I think his finishing needed a bit of refinement. Um, but the amount of times when he did start playing for us, the amount of chances he would create for himself with his own energy. Um, and he could have scored a lot more than he did for us. He missed quite a few chances. But yeah, to play against him in training, he was a real handful uh, for all those reasons. The 2-1 defeat at Colchester in, in January was followed, Coops, by the news that every Cherries fan had, had been dreading. <clears throat> Excuse me, that Eddie Howe and Jason Tindall were, were on their way to Burnley. Um, tell us how you, as, as a playing squad, found out that news. Yeah, my memory's not too clear on that. I, it, was, it was a blurry one because we'd obviously heard rumours um, and then it was a bit of a case of will he, won't he? And I think, if I remember rightly, we were all convinced he was staying. And then last minute, he wasn't staying. So um, it was a bit of a... By the point of it happening, I thought he was going to stay. Um, but we were aware of the rumours as everyone was that he might leave. So, yeah, again, it's another one where the club at the time couldn't keep hold of people if something from a, from a higher division came calling. So, um, again, he deserved that opportunity. What was the feeling in the dressing room, though, for, for someone who'd been such a big part of the last two or three years? What's going to happen next, really? Um, Eddie was... Fantastic, the way he come in and the way he adapted everyone's mentality, mentality and got everyone together tactically, just everything about him. He was obviously at the beginning of what he became and we could all see it and we could all feel it and it was better than anything we'd had previous and we weren't sure if we were gonna be able to get anything in of that level really. So, you know, we, we didn't know what was gonna happen. The club moved pretty quickly to a point, um, Lee Brabber. You've already mentioned him uh, in this uh, as Eddie's replacement. Steve Fletcher, of course, as his uh, assistant. Um, you are or, or were pretty close with, with Bradders. He had pretty big shoes to, to fill in terms of Eddie's, didn't he? Because he was unproven himself at that stage, Bradders. Yeah, I think, that, and Bradders really did go straight into it. Whereas, you know, Eddie was doing a bit of coaching. He was coaching alongside Kevin Bond, as we all know. So, but Bradders was chucked straight into it and, uh, considering that, I think he'd done really well. Um, he obviously had a good run of results when he first took over. Some of them were lucky, but I, I do think Eddie had left um, a framework for Bradders to just try and carry on. And Bradders can be forgiven, I think, for not necessarily delivering the same messages that Eddie did due to his inexperience, but he carried on the type of sessions we were doing. So we had the tempo, we had the energy, we had the structure of what we were trying to do and kind of carried on kept the momentum going a little bit from what Eddie had created. So, um, yeah, considering he really was thrown straight into it, I thought he'd done really well. What was it like to have who someone you would class as a friend, perhaps to then become your manager? How difficult was that to deal with? Uh, <clears throat> well, I don't think it was difficult at all. Bradders was one of those who, a bit like Eddie really, he had the respect of the dressing room for different reasons. Eddie was, you know, a straight line professional, really harsh on himself, really wanted to drive himself to be better. And obviously Bradders did, but he was more of a one of the lads type. Um, but he'd had a good career, Bradders. He, you know, he, he had some big transfer moves. He's scored goals in the championship. So everyone respected him straight away. So he never had a problem with any of the lads. I think he rolled into it quite nicely, if I'm honest. You spent a lot of time in the trenches alongside Marvin Bartley, and you've already made reference to that game at Plymouth, the 2-1 win there at the end of January. That was his final game before he followed Eddie to, to Burnley. Just tell us a little bit about what he was like as a teammate, Marvin. <laughs> Marvin, what a character. I just think of his laugh straight away as soon as you mentioned his name. Um, Marv was a real character. He was a real pot stirrer. He would, he would uh, load the gun for other people to, to get at each other, but... If you made him laugh, everyone knew about it. He was the loudest, loudest laugh in the room. Him and Piercy were really close, really tight. And um, 
They used to come in in their driving school and go, Marvin uh, was used to have great banter. They used to go at each other all the time. Um, yeah, and it was brilliant. And obviously as a teammate, Marv was so athletic. Um, I, I just used to remember getting the ball sometimes at centre back and just seeing his arms in the air when he started making one of his channel runs. And I just put it in there because of, of how quick he was. Uh, and on the flip side of that, when we were ever being counter-attacked and I was trying to slow down the attacker because I couldn't run, I had no speed. I just see Marvin making up ground behind him. And I uh, just thought, I just delay him long enough, Marvin will come back and get me out of trouble with, which he always did. So yeah, he was a great lad, Marvin. And um, he'd done really well for us. He, Bondi signed him, I think. And uh, yeah, he'd done well for us. The, win the window fitter he was. A just one quick funny story about Marvin. Um, the most eventful night ever I had working at the Echo was that transfer deadline night when I took a phone call from a guy who was Marvin's agent and he said to me, um, Neil, have you any idea where Marvin is? Apparently he'd gone off with another agent who'd sorted out the move to, to Burnley and his, <laughs> his original agent didn't know anything about it. It's quite, uh, quite an eye opener. Anyway, swiftly moving on. Um, Bradders and Fletch enjoyed a flying start to life in management. It was a 10-match unbeaten run, including a win over Brighton, the leaders in their first home game. That run kept the team in second place behind the, the Seagulls. You started all 10 of those games. Did you feel back to your best by then? I can't remember, to be honest with you. <laughs> um, yes. Yeah. Um, I do remember the Brighton game, though. I remember Feeney scored a volley, I believe, if you... Uh, and it was a um, it was a strong league that year. We had some good teams. I remember Southampton coming down and Brighton coming down. I remember the the crowd it was a big crowd. It was loud. Um, so yeah, winning that game was was a great feeling, great buzz. The ten game unbeaten run kept you in second place for the majority of the time. The second automatic promotion place did. Did you or any of the other lads start thinking that automatic promotion could really be on the cards now? Um, well, yeah, we knew it was on the cards because of where we were in the league. Um, it was sustaining the results was the issue. Like I said, I think we were fortunate with a few of the results we got during that unbeaten run. And I think we were all aware of that, that eventually some of the luck we were getting was going to run out. Um, so whether we believed we would stay there, I'm not so sure. But obviously, once you're in that position, you know, you've got a chance of going up automatically. So... As it turns out, the luck did run out a little bit. <laughs> yeah, it did. We had three defeats on the trot, um, first of all. The second of which was a 3-1 home defeat here by Southampton. Can you remember anything about that game which might have made you a viral sensation on YouTube? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. Um, do you know what? I never realised it at the time, what a bad challenge it actually was, because obviously I was looking at the ball and I just saw, I didn't know who it was. I saw him at the corner of my eye running towards me. I had my eyes fixed on the ball and thought, he's going to jump into me here. I'm going to get a foul. So I just focused on contacting. And I initially thought he jumped into me with his shoulder and everyone went mad. I remember everyone running around him. I've got up to the ref. I thought I was going to have to try and sell it to the ref a little bit, try and get him <laughs> sent off. Um, and then when I watched it back, I couldn't believe it. I just couldn't believe it. If I was fixed, if my feet were planted on the floor, he could have done some serious damage. And, and I don't know what motivated that. But uh, it's, it's funny looking back on it now. Well, when you, and do, when you say you had to sell it to the ref there, you got straight back to your feet. There yeah. was no theatrics. No, it was just like, ref, come on. He's jumped into me there. That's the kind of thing I was saying. I didn't realise he had two-footed me around the waist. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it just flipped me around. Like I said, I was lucky I was in the air. Um, just flipped me around and a soft landing. Just for those people who don't know, if you put Oscar Goburn tackle into Google, you will see it straight away. Like we said, nearly a million views already. The Southampton player just came hurtling at Sean Cooper and like he said, two-footed him in the, in the, in the waist. Unless he's had that many views. What, a million views? If you type in Oscar, it'll probably come up before the Oscars themselves on YouTube. Um, <laughs> hey, though, on that is, uh, I was out in Southampton a few weeks later and I saw him. <laughs> and uh, did he reverse just, the, uh, no, he challenge? just stood there and I went up to him and I said, what's that about? What are you thinking? He went, oh, sorry, man. Do you want a drink? <laughs> But yeah, go on. Yeah. That, that was it. <laughs> One that drink it. for a waist high kung fu. Tackle. Yeah, exactly. So <laughs> we made peace. Well, that was uh, that was nice to see in a, in a local derby. Um, the sticky run of results, uh, unfortunately, though, did continue. Two wins from the, the final twelve games of that season. Um, saw you finish sixth in the end, a point clear of of Lake Norian and, and Exeter as well. Um, why did it sort of tail off? I'm not sure, to be honest. 
one of those things you talk about, you know, automatic promotion might be in your mind, but then you're thinking actually, well, there might be a turn of luck at, at some point. Do you start believing too early that, okay, this job is nearly done and then your, your mind wavers and you're, you're off the, your mind's off the ball? Something you probably instill in your lads the opposite now. Yeah, I imagine, I can't remember too clearly the reason why that happened, but I imagine at the time, having been where we were in the league and then slowly slipping, as you say, the anxiety would have heightened and then we'd put a bit of pressure on ourselves to to end up in the playoff places by doing so well. Um, so I imagine that had a part to play in it. Just going to throw in um, a 3-3 draw at Peterborough away on April Fool's Day. Adam Smith scored a late leveller during his season on loan here from, from Tottenham. What did you make of a young Adam Smith in those days? Yeah, I rated him highly. He's a, a bit like Harry. I remember training against him for the first time and he was another one when he pressed you when he got close to you you had to get rid of the ball because you couldn't get away from him um, but I obviously played centre half alongside him for most of those games and he was just up and down up and down um, left me exposed in the channel a few times I have to say but um, it was nice it was nice to have him you know creating so many attacks down our side I thought he was a very good player so you went all the way up to Hartlepool and got a 2-2 draw which clinched a place in the playoffs what was the mood in the camp heading into the home leg against Huddersfield? Well, we knew Huddersfield were a good team. Uh, we knew they were a big team, um, which ultimately proved to be one of their biggest weapons, particularly in the second leg, um, set pieces and, and all of those type of things. But anything can happen in the playoffs. We know that, but we did back ourselves. We did think we had enough to, to go and beat them. You went behind in that first leg and then Danny Ings had the chance to draw you level from the penalty spot. It's big pressure for a young lad. There was a lot of hanging around as well, and his penalty was eventually saved. Donald McDermott eventually equalised for you. How did you feel after the first leg? Was it advantage to them, or it's only half time and we're still in it, sort of thing? Yeah, probably that one. It was, it was, you know, it was, in my mind, it was nil nil. We go up there, we win the game, we go through. Um, so I thought we played well in the first in the first leg actually. Um, it's just a shame Ingsy obviously missed his penalty, but Donal was another one. He was capable of magic when he felt like it. He was such a good player. Um, so yeah, it was uh, going up there. I just thought, obviously win the game, we go through, but you know, I didn't realise what, what was to come. So it was four days later, you went to uh, West Yorkshire, 2-2 two -two it was. Steve Lovell scored, both won a penalty, a stunning individual strike as well. Just tell us a little bit about what he was like to play with. Came with a fantastic pedigree, having scored lots of goals in Scotland. And he once agreed to play for this club for nothing when there was an embargo. And we, we couldn't sign him because the block was put on there. Just tell us about him. Um, well, I think that Huddersfield game, the away leg, is was Steve Lovell. It was the real Steve Lovell, you know. I think he struggled with injuries and, you know, back to what we were talking about earlier. He was another one just couldn't quite get fit for long enough and it had a real impact on him. Um, but I thought he was outstanding in that second leg and the goals he scored, that was, that was him. Whenever I played against him in training, he was a threat in behind with his pace, but he was really clever with it. He knew when to threaten him behind to receive it feet or come short to, to run him behind. He, he had a real intelligence behind his pace. Um, and obviously, uh, I think, I can't remember which one of his goals it was when he rounded the goalie. It was a great finish. And um, you could see, I think when he celebrated that, he wasn't just celebrating the occasion. I think it was for him personally, also his his struggles that he had with injury. I think that was a relief for him as well. But a great lad uh, on his day, very, very hard to play against. So 2-2 two -two after uh, 90 minutes in West Yorkshire. Danny Ings then heads you into the lead in extra time. Once you get that goal in extra time, are you thinking, that's it, we've done the job now? No, the, um, not just because I'm pessimistic by nature, but... Um, Huddersfield, as I said, carry a, a real threat from set pieces, which obviously is where their third goal come from. I think McComb came on. Is it McComb, striker? Jamie McComb. Yeah, or yeah. was he a defender? Or he went half, on he? He so, and five. I think he came on and he was and he was really big. And for their third goal, Kay scored it, and I had been marking him all game. But McComb was on the pitch at the time, so Piercy had then gone to mark him, and I was then trying to mark Clark, whilst telling one of my teammates to mark Kay. I won't say who it was and they took forever to mark him. And then the ball come in, so I was still in and around Ken. I remember it, I, try, I tried to go and jump behind him, but it was too late, he was already in front of me. 
half unmarked and then he scored and I was raging. I was raging, so frustrated with it. And it probably didn't help when uh, a few minutes later, Jason Pierce was then sent off for a yeah. uh, tackle on, on Kevin Kilban. The highlights of the game show you uh, doing your bit with the referee, putting your view across. Um, did you feel it was the right decision then or was that just the frustration <laughs> bubbling over? Well, having trained with Piercy every day and played with him every week, that was just a standard Piercy tackle, which he never seemed to get sent off for. So I was surprised, but, you know, having watched it back, it, it was it was strong. So I, th I think there was no real arguments to be had with that one. So you get through to, to penalties at 3-3. Um, we've seen cheeky penalties in the headlines for the wrong reasons in the last few days with Sergio Aguero, but Michael Symes was a much cooler customer and actually found the net, didn't he? Uh, those are the sort of ones you're probably watching back on the halfway line thinking, I'm glad that's gone in. Yeah, well, that's, that just sometimes, yeah, it was very laid back, very calm. Um, and yeah, I, I, you know, I backed him to put it in. He was a good penalty taker, Symesy. Um, so yeah, I was pleased to see it go in, you're right. It's the worst possible scenario. You're walking forward and your penalty saved. It happened to Liam Feeney. And then the worst, second worst possible scenario is the next man misses and Anton Robinson hit the bar and now you really are on the back foot. Yeah, um, I felt for both of those. Um, I got on really well with everyone really, but I was quite close to Anton and Feeney whilst they were here. And yeah, it's not nice to see your teammates miss a penalty, but then when it means you've got to score or you're out, it's even worse. <laughs> and you did send Ian Bennett the wrong way, but it was heart heartbreaking in the end. What were your initial emotions? When we lost? Yeah. Um, I was just gutted, really. You know, everyone had worked so hard. Just on that night, You obviously there was a, hard work throughout the season to get you there but just for that evening that night I thought I thought the lads were outstanding and that the grit and desire that they showed to get ourselves in front and ultimately concede a late equaliser we were so close and you just you just gutted um, and yeah it, it was strange really you don't really I can't put it into words it's just a real empty gutted feeling I was lucky enough to be at the Hampshire Senior Cup final when you won on penalties recently. And it's a science taking penalties. I've also seen the footage of you in training with Lewis Price, getting advice from a goalkeeper, giving that to the players about how to take penalties. Just tell us as a coach now, were things different then or is it exactly the same? Uh, we did uh, uh, practice penalties before um, and like I said in, to the lads, I've seen the clip. I did miss it the day before. Um, and I went to go top left and stuck it over the bar. So on the day I went top right. Um, so you can't replicate the pressure. You can practice the technique. But Pricey had some really good thoughts and ideas on that, which he shared with the lads. Uh, and a couple of other things we did, which uh, Moles actually implemented when he was here. We were practicing for a potential penalty shootout in a cup competition before COVID and uh, about where the lads position themselves on the pitch and then the goalkeeper going to get the ball for the next taker so they don't have to run off line to go and get the ball. Um, so those things, when you win, you look and think maybe they did make a difference, but um, who knows? I thought the lads' penalties, by the way, in the Hampshire Cup final were outstanding and under that pressure to go and execute it the way they did was pleasing. Empty stadiums, penalty shootouts. We had one here, obviously, against Crystal Palace in the League Cup. I'm not sure if you were here for that one when the, the goalkeepers ended up taking them. Um, is there, are you in the Hampshire Senior Cup, obviously in a smaller non-league ground, it's probably not quite as, as as much pressure, but do you think it's harder in an empty stadium when the whole everything is silent and everybody's waiting for you rather than that background noise of the crowd trying to put you off, which you'd expect in a football environment? I've never done a penalty shootout in an empty stadium. Um, no, watching the, like, maybe when you're watching the lads in, in well, silence for no fans yeah well there was three Eastley fans over the other side of the pitch making a right racket so <laughs> and that's that's the thing uh, you can really they hear get behind every closed door Eastley fans <laughs> can't they <laughs> you, you, yeah they were, they were stood on top of something so they weren't breaking any rules <laughs> um, but you can really hear and that, that's one of the things I experienced in non-league is you can hear the individual abuse quite clearly um, so I don't know to be honest I imagine for me personally, I was always just focused. I could block it out quite easily. Um, some people may be able to. I can't speak for other people, but it never bothered me. It's a stupid question. And going back to Huddersfield, we know that 
All the cameras would have been all over the winner's dressing room and we're seeing all the jubilation in there. What was it like in your dressing room? Yeah, just a, a carry on from the, the emotion I just said about really um, an acknowledgement, a well done, uh, fantastic effort. If, you know, if you're going to lose, that's, that's one way to do it by giving everything and taking it to the wire. So um, it was just a real, we were deflated, but at the same time proud of ourselves for, for the effort that we gave, I think. You never want to lose, and this is another of Neil's stupid questions. Would you rather lose in that situation or lose on the day at Wembley in the final? Well, I would have liked to have gotten, well, it would have been Old Trafford at the time, but yeah, to get to the final, I'd rather do it that way. <laughs> You'd rather have the day at Wembley and experience maybe a harder feeling having, you know, having lost on 90 minutes on the day, but still had the occasion and everything to look forward to and made more progress. Yeah, and I think it's just another big occasion to have experienced and to have learned from. So definitely that way around, yeah. You hear a lot of people say it's the, you know, the, the final itself is the worst way to lose, but I guess it's it's probably the hardest for a few days. What what were that, I guess, the next week after that Huddersfield loss? I mean, how did you deal with it? Did you immediately fly off on holiday? How did things work there? Did you, did you watch the final, for example? I didn't watch the final, no. Um, but uh, didn't dwell on it for too long. And, and as I said, there, there was a lot of good memories from it. Uh, we were so close and we were, if you look at, the money their players were being paid compared to us and all of those things. It, it was a real mismatch. And the league itself, I think there was there's a lot of big, bigger clubs in terms of finances in the in the division at the time. So it was quite an achievement for us to have gotten there. But not to say that we'll settle for what what we had done. But uh, I didn't dwell on it for too long. I took the good you know, the good positive memories from it and experiences and just, just learn from them and move forward. I know that's a bit corny, but I guess that's all you can do. We're going to come on to your, your playing career overall with the Cherries and on to your, your coaching career as well. But just staying on the playoff theme, bearing in mind that the relevance of doing this podcast in the, the week that the, the championship playoffs arrive, two-legged playoff semi-finals. Um, have they got more cagey, do you think, now? Because the stakes are higher, particularly at the top level championship up to the Premier League. Do, are, we, are we going to see nil-nils and one-nils over the course of the next couple of legs? Do you think is, is, people are scared to make mistakes in playoff games? Um, yeah, I imagine they always have been. I don't think it's going to be KG between us, though. I think our playoff in particular, I think there's going to be goals. So just hopefully more for us. <laughs> you said you hadn't watched the, the highlights of the game. Have you watched the penalty shootout again? Yes, I have. And what, what prompts you to sort of watch that, if you like? What, what prompts me? Yeah, well, why did you want to see it again when you didn't want to watch the highlights of the game, if you like? Um, I think I was with some of the lads couple of times and we just speak about it occasionally and just whack it on it's easy to access um, and we just have a look at it just for to reminisce a little bit I guess As we're playoff theme and we're in playoff mode just give us your thoughts ahead of our playoff against Brentford um, uh, I think with our squad and our personnel and our players we've got some real attacking threats. So I just fancy us against anyone on our day. So I think going into that, certainly got nothing to fear. Um, I think if we approach it with an attacking mindset, then we've got a very good chance. Let's go back a little bit to, to where it all started to kick off uh, for Sean Cooper. Obviously, um, we'll come on to you getting to the cherries ultimately, but let's take us right back to the early part of your career on the island and then ending up at, at Portsmouth as well. Um, just talk us through, it, I guess, in brief, the early part of your career, where you started to really make an impression, where you first got noticed and, and how you ended up at Portsmouth. Uh, I was playing for the Isle of Wight as an under 12, playing up for the under 13s against Portsmouth schools. And Sean North was watching and um, yeah, wanted to sign me. So I had an option at the time between there, between Bournemouth and Southampton. And uh, a couple of my friends from the island had, were signing for Portsmouth. So I chose to go over with them. Was it whichever one was easier to get to by ferry that you'd go to? Uh, well, that helped, yeah. <laughs> um, no, it was just about arranging lifts to and from. So if I was at Southampton, I think I'd have been the only one. So. Um, it, logistically, it was better to go to Pompey. I just, I'm trying to imagine, like as a as a young player coming over to Portsmouth and training the academy, because most people, you know, you've got to get your mum or dad to drive you ten minutes down the road around the corner. Physically, having to get a ferry. I mean, how much of an impact did that have, for example, on your schoolwork and things like that? The, the time it took and everything. It had an impact on everything. I, I'll be honest with you, I, I detested it at the time. We trained Monday nights, uh, Thursday nights, 
and we had a game on Sunday mornings. So, you know, a young lad, a teenager wanting to socialize with all their mates, just never had time for it. I had to leave school and get on a bus uh, to another part of the island where I'd get a lift from Lewis Buxton's mum to the ferry, get the ferry, and then we'd have to walk or get the taxi on the other side and then get a taxi back to the boat. And if it was windy, you then had to get diverted over to the car ferry and it was it was a nightmare. And then get a lift home. You weren't home till 11, half 11. And, and then obviously on a Sunday, if we had an 11 o'clock kickoff at Leighton Orient away, we were up so early. And, and yeah, I didn't enjoy it one bit, the traveling, I hated it. What was the, the, the tipping point when you in, in decided to move over full time? Well, I left school and got a scholarship an apprenticeship at the time. And so I moved into Diggs when I was 16. Uh, me and Lewis Buxton moved into a place together with a family. And um, I really enjoyed it, to be honest with you. It was nice to be away from home and just, just playing football without having to catch a boat every time you had to play. And of course you made your Pompey impression pretty early as well. Just give us an overview of your, your early days in the, in the Portsmouth first team in front of you know that amazing Fratton Park crowd. Yeah, I mean, it, Lewis had already made quite a few appearances for the first team so he, I obviously lived with him and he'd done very well and then I made my debut away at, at Crystal Palace and I remember sitting at the um, the table uh, sorry in the room waiting for the meeting room waiting for the team to be unveiled on the day of the game and Neil McNabb who was the reserve team manager at the time he walked in and he just walked across the other side of the room looked at me and raised his eyebrows so my heart jumped in my throat and I thought what does that mean and then the the team sheet got lifted and I was starting right midfield. And um, I just remember I was really nervous and excited, but by the time kickoff came around, I was actually okay. Um, so that was a good experience. But then, as you say, playing at Fratton Park, I was fortunate enough to do it towards the end of my career as well, it was amazing. The fans there, the supporters there, I'd obviously been in the crowd so many times um, to watch the first team, but playing in front of them was brilliant. Um, and I was very fortunate to have that opportunity at, at such a young age. Was that surpassed, would you say? Is the Fratton Park atmosphere surpassed by anything else you experienced in your career? No, uh, actually, I tell a lie. Yes, the Huddersfield game, away. Because even though it was an away fixture, it was loud. Our fans were outstanding that night and obviously we lost it, but I just, I'll never forget the atmosphere. And when Steve Lovell, I think, scored his second goal in particular, I just remember it. and. Yeah, it was an unbelievable feeling and it was an unbelievable atmosphere. Um, so that one for me does surpass it, yeah. You actually touched on your versatility when you said you were playing right midfield in your um, your first game for Pompey. You wouldn't have played right midfield too much here, would you? You were mainly right back, bit of um, centre back, bit of centre midfield as well. Yeah, I did. I have played right midfield a couple of times for Bournemouth. I played everywhere for Bournemouth apart from striker or in goal. Um, but yeah, it was something I'd started out as a young lad as a centre mid, uh, then I went to Pompey and I, most centre mids break into an older age group or a first team as a right back. And I started playing for the under 19s and doing quite well as a right back. So they just thought he's a right back. Uh, but I wasn't quick enough to be a right back. I, anything 1v1 that got at me, I struggled with uh, down the line. So I didn't play centre midfield for quite a long time until I came back here and Sean O'Driscoll played me in my second season there. Um, and I was hit and miss in there, to be honest but I didn't mind playing anywhere on the pitch, um, whatever the team needed. And I think we had a small squad, so there was a few of us who got moved around frequently and you know, we were all happy to do so. Just staying on the Pompey theme for a moment, if I say Harry Redknapp to you, what, what does that uh, conjure up in terms of Portsmouth? <laughs> you, say, yeah, you say that name, I feel like I'm about to get told off or something. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's probably the answer we needed. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, uh, Harry Redknapp come in, he was, director of football, I think, or something. He was looking over Graham Ricks' shoulder a little bit for a while, and then eventually he got the job and uh, made a lot of really good signings. And obviously the 2003 team that got promoted, I think it was 2003, was a really strong team. And he, you know, he signed some great players I was fortunate enough to train with and see up close and personal. Um, but he always tells a story about me, Harry, and he always tells it wrong. Every time, every time I've seen him and he sees other people, he's hello, hello Coops, how are you? And uh, he goes, I never forget it, I never forget it. I can't remember what game it was. It was Super Sunday, it was Liverpool, Manchester United, something like that. And he always tells the story and he goes, so the next day on Monday, I go up to Coops, morning Coops, how are you? Did you watch the game yesterday? 
No, Gaffer, I didn't watch it. He said, oh, what were you watching? What were you watching? And he, he always tells everybody I was watching Neighbours. And that was not the answer I gave him. And he bat, he's like, Neighbours? Neighbours? <laughs> and I'm like, every time I'm like, Harry, it was MTV. It wasn't Neighbours. <laughs> Anyone who knows me knows it was MTV back then. So uh, he tells it every time I see him. <laughs> Neil, do you want to do, do the, uh, the Harry Redknapp training ground? Uh, question that Coop sort of had many times involving, <laughs> yeah. involving a ball and a TV clip. It's a, f a fan's question has come in from John Amos on Twitter. Is it true you were the player who blasted a ball at Harry Redknapp when he was being interviewed by Tony Husband and you got given short shrift? Now I know why you're in the reserves. There's another word in there as well. Yeah, there man. was, yeah. Um, no, it wasn't me. It was uh, my friend at the time, same age as me, Terry Parker. I remember him coming in afterwards. You never guess what's just happened. <laughs> so what? <laughs> Me and Casey, the lad Mark Casey, we were volleying the ball to each other. He goes, I shanked it and it's hit the gaff up. <laughs> so yeah, that was my, that, that's, the, that's the first I got told of it anyway, but it wasn't me, uh, I can safely say. Did Terry Parker last much longer after that? Uh, not at Pompey, no. Um, he was good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he, ended, he played a few games for Oxford and then, um, and then he dropped out of the game. Well, um, that's put that to bed anyway for anybody who's always wondered about that TV clip. And if you, again, if you don't know the TV clip we're looking about, just YouTube Harry Redknapp getting hit by the ball and you'll immediately find it. Um, let's bring it back then. We've, we've dealt with your Pompey uh, career there. Let's bring it back to, to Bournemouth here because you played under Sean, obviously, O'Driscoll. You played under Bondi and you played under Jimmy Quinn. Three di very different characters, it's fair to say. Give us your, your sort of brief overview of them as, as individual managers and how good they were or, or not for you. <clears throat> well, Sean O'Driscoll had a massive impact. Um, I remember at the time the, the club was having to rebuild. They'd sold a lot of their good players. Um, so they had to scrape the barrel almost for what was out there, what was available. And I, I knew Sean because when I came on trial at Bournemouth as an under 12, he was actually taking the game, strangely enough. And uh, he's always remembered me from that day. So anyway, I came in and he just sort of, he made me think about the game differently, more from a team perspective, but focusing on little things which I'd never been really taught in that much detail until that point, little things, defending throw-ins, locking out when you're attacking, all these types of things. And one of the best things about Sean though, maybe because we had a small squad, but it was the room you had for failure. So, and I needed that space to develop. If, if I'd come in and the club were more financially secure, they had a bigger squad and I had put in some of the performances I did, I probably wouldn't have kicked the ball again. But one of Sean's things was, I don't care if you make a mistake, don't stop trying, try it again. I'll be more annoyed if you stop attempting it. Um, so I was able, I had that room under Sean to to be poor and learn from it. Um, so he had a real impact. I, I really enjoyed playing for Sean. Kevin Bond? Yeah, Bondy, again, I knew him from Pompey. Um, and uh, he was a really good guy, Bondy, as everybody always says, uh, a decent coach. Um, it just didn't really, it just didn't really get going with him. I just think we were on the brink. We were quite good sometimes and not very good other times. Um, but personally, I felt I got on all right with Bondi. And I, you know, I enjoyed him as a manager. It's just a shame we couldn't produce more for him. I think it would be fair to say it didn't quite get going under Jimmy Quinn either. <laughs> yeah, well, that, that didn't last too long. I, I automatically think of the army camp when you talk about Jimmy Quinn, um, which is... Uh, it was it was freezing cold and we had to sleep in these uh, barracks with no central heating or anything. And one memory that I've got on the first day was um, Darren Anderton, who was our captain at the time, having to stand out in front of all of us who were all dressed up, marching, and he had to tell us left, right, left, and Daz is standing there shouting it. And it, it was uncomfortable following those orders, but seeing him bark the orders was worse. Um, and yeah, that just springs to mind when you talk about Corny. You've obviously read the running order here because the next question is you played alongside Darren Anderson. Just tell us about, I know he was at the end of his career. Just tell us about what it was like to play alongside him here. It was a real privilege. Um, he was one of my favourite players growing up. Uh, often when you run around the playground shouting names, you know, my sister was a Spurs fan. We used to play football. I was a Man United fan. Um, and we, we both used to love Daz and then obviously his first day of training, 
I was playing against him again and uh, he was just hitting passes that you just couldn't stop. And you knew straight away, this, this guy is another level. And I had trained with a lot of very good players at my time at Pompey, but he was better than all of them. And, and um, you know, like I said, it was a real privilege, but it was a real, you could learn from Daz just by playing with him or just watching him. Uh, the things he saw, the, the decisions he made. And he was one of those who, we thought we were a footballing team, but we were quick to go long under a bit of pressure. Whereas Daz was one who would be brave to get on the ball and he'd just play passes and you'd just see him do it and think, well, that's what we've got to do. And he brought calmness to the team and we all started passing the ball a bit more because of we didn't pass it to him, he'd, he'd have a go at you. But um, no, he was, uh, he was an unbelievable player. I, I could sit here and talk all day about him. I remember the camaraderie in that squad. Um, you know, times were tough, the finances were tough and all that. But sort of moving on 10 years later, I know Darren, I think you still keep in touch with Darren. It's difficult. He's moved away and, you know, things evolve. But you still keep in touch with a lot of those guys from 10 years ago and earlier? Uh, yes. Yes, I do. And obviously, um, technology, social media makes it easier these days. But that's one of the best things. Uh, about my time at the club was the company. Uh, some of the other lads were here for a long time and if they did go away, they stayed living in the area. So I was fortunate enough to, to stay in close contact with a core group of players, Darren being one of them, you know, Warren Cummings, Alan Connell, Brett Pittman, Danny Hollands, uh, amongst others. So uh, that was one of the best things to come from my playing career, was, was the friends that I made. And um, yeah, I was fortunate enough to, to have played with, with those guys. Jimmy Quinn obviously left at the end of 2008 and Eddie Howe was appointed for the first time. I was only 29. You look certain to go down, surely. Um, on minus 17? Yeah. <laughs> of course, it was minus 17. <laughs> <laughs> they made a documentary about it, Neil, don't you know? Um, well, we were fortunate. I think it was Luton as well who had points that year. They had 30, didn't they? So that obviously helped. But... Um, uh, what can I say about Eddie um, that hasn't already been said? I obviously, I played with him at Portsmouth for a little bit as well. So I knew, I knew his character as a player. Uh, I knew how driven, determined he was from self to improve and the standards he set himself. So that crossed over into his management. And, you know, he was, an, he had the biggest impact on me was the way I started to train when he started coaching alongside Kevin Bond, he'd come in and I remember he used to take some of the younger lads of which I was still one at the time. And um, he'd take us in afternoon sessions and um, really got us to focus on the the simple basics that you can often get wrong if, if you get too lax and just tighten them up. And then the work rate and the effort and the application of everyone just went through the roof. And I think you started to see that in our performances as a team, there was our fitness levels went up our organisation levels went up, our motivation went up and our our tactical approaches to games were better. And that, you know, we went on to achieve what we did that year in staying up and, you know, he obviously has to take a lot of the credit for that. The Grimsby game aside, just tell us about that greatest, the second half of that greatest escape season. It was a roller coaster and you can only talk about any of Mark Molesley's goals for five minutes, no more. <laughs> um, well, the second half, the second half of um, that season, Eddie, I always remember if ever we were in trouble during a game in the first half, we'd just sound the pitch, look, get to half time because you knew he was going to come in with a solution of, of some kind and he always fix things but he had a way of delivering messages which was simple and it was clear and um yeah i just thought he guided us through that half of the season really well really well now you were captain of course but you missed the uh, the grimsby game the famous grimsby game what happened <laughs> um mark mosley smashed me in training in the week <laughs> leading up to it which he denies to this day but anyone who's ever seen moles play will know that he liked a touch of a football and uh, he dribbled himself into trouble which he did often. Uh, and then he was on his usual, I'm going to dribble myself back out of this trouble now, which he did often as well. But um, I managed to nick the ball off him and he, he just ch chased his touch. And I think he was a bit frustrated. So he left a bit on me. 
and it flipped me up around the uh, in the air and I landed on my toe, which turned my knee inwards. So yeah, I was out for the for the Grimsby game because of moles. Um, but you know, who knows if I played that game, we may have lost it. <laughs> Oscar Goban bought you a drink when he turned you around in the air. Did Mark Molesley buy you a drink? No, he, just, I, he just denies it. <laughs> <laughs> you gave him a job as well. Um, <laughs> if any training ground footage was recorded in those days, like it is these days, you'd have the video evidence of him turning you over. Um, you missed a large chunk, of course, of the following season after going up to, to League One. I guess when you worked so hard to, to, to be promoted, that, that must have been a, a huge disappointment. Yeah, it was. Um, what I'll say, though, is playing in the Burton game away kind of made up for not playing in the Grimsby game the year before. And it's strange because I played so many games. I think that was the, the season before I'd played more games that year than I had done in any other season. Um, but I missed that game. And you, when you're there and you on the day, you just don't feel part of it. Even though you're part of the celebrations and you're happy, it just doesn't feel the same. Whereas on the flip side, I hardly contributed to the promotion, but I'd played in the Burton game. I felt like I was there for every minute of it. Um, <laughs> So I made the most of it, that's for sure. But yeah, it was uh, it was nice to nick a few appearances at the end of the season, and you know they're they're the memories I choose to hold on to from that year. And after the, uh, the playoff near miss that we referred to earlier on, of course, Lee Bradbury obviously parted with the club that the next season. Um, we mentioned the, your, your sort of relationship uh, with him. How tough were, was that when he left the club as well? Yeah, uh, it wasn't it wasn't tough. It's just part of the game. Um, it was just another case of right where we go now what's happening next um i think brad has done like i said before a really good job considering the circumstances in which he got the job and what he had done prior to that which was pretty much nothing in terms of coaching um but it stood him in good stead obviously for what he went on to do with haven't um done really good things with them there but um yeah it was just a case of right what's happening now who's coming in and what do they want us to do so you left at the end of 11 12 um, soon after Bradders had gone and Paul Groves had taken over. Just sum up your seven years here for us. As a person, I think, obviously grew up a lot due to the experiences, the, the small successes and the, the failures that we had, the relationships that I'd formed, um, the friends that I had made from a footballing perspective. I think I was fortunate enough to have been exposed to Sean O'Driscoll's way of doing things and, you know, Eddie Howe at the start of what he was doing. Um, so I think I take things from, I don't think anything past that from Bournemouth onwards, I ever picked up anything new. I think it was mainly Sean O'Driscoll and Eddie and my youth team coach at Pompey, Mark O'Connor. That's where all the, all of the messages that have stuck are from those three, really. Um, so, yeah, I just think I learned a lot as a person and as a player and, and I made great friends and, um, you know, I really enjoyed it. After leaving, you had spells at Crawley, back to Portsmouth, Sutton, Eastbourne and Pool Town. Obviously, you're still doing a job you love. That sounds like hard work. If getting the boat from the Isle of Wight when you were a kid was hard work, you were pounding the motorways there, weren't you? Yeah. Um, Sutton was, I was lucky Sutton was part-time and, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd gone back to Portsmouth and again, I'd struggled with injury. Um, and uh, I thought I was done, to be honest. Uh, but funnily enough, Perchie was the 21s manager and he was letting me train here to keep fit. And then Paul Doswell rung me at Sutton. And then I got offered a deal there. And that was only part-time. So the one thing about part-time, I will say, is it gives you a lot of time to think and a lot of time doing nothing, which isn't nice. So you soon realise quickly, OK, I've got to do something. Um, and at that time... Just after that, actually, Alan Connell had started coaching in the academy. Uh, and so I rung him and just said, oh, look, I'm going to come in if you don't mind. And he was fine. So I used to go in and watch him a little bit with the under 12s, I think he was at the time. Uh, I even remember getting up 6 a.m. to go and watch them at Stevenage away, I think it was, on a, on a Sunday morning. But I, it was really interesting. I thought Al was really good. He was a real natural. I could see how much he enjoyed it. And so I thought, yeah, I'll have a go at that. So I started coaching a little bit and then I rung Joe Roach and he he kind of got me in his office straight away for a chat and said, look, there's a part-time role available with the uh, under 13s. So I started doing that, yeah. And, and that was my way in really. But I think it was having dropped into part-time football really kicked me into gear a little bit. And that's when, um, that's when I started thinking about coaching. You must have seen some sights on your travels in non-league. Does any, 
Does anything spring to mind or has anything stayed with you in particular? <laughs> Not really. I mean, I don't want to say too much, but there's a lot of good individual players in non-league that I didn't realise um, before I started playing in it. The style of play of the teams and, and some of the touchline conduct and the, at times, to be honest, the lack of class, you know, used to frustrate me. But there were some really good players, uh, a few rough diamonds knocking around those levels. So it was a real eye opener for me. Um, so, you know, I, I suppose I took something from that in that in that sense. But yeah, nothing, nothing that really sticks. Did you have the, the roly poly goalie was on your uh, on your, your books at Sutton, wasn't he? Wayne Shaw? Yeah, he was. Yeah. Um, yeah, he was. Yeah, no, he was. He was a good lad. Uh, sure, he was. Um, I was. I had actually left by the time Pygate happened. But um, yeah, make of it what you will. Uh, I remember reading a piece that you did with with Neil, and I must have either found it on the, on a street corner somewhere because I certainly wouldn't have bought a copy of the Echo to read it um, <laughs> when you retired, saying that you were relieved and you were kidding yourself, um, thinking you could keep on playing and um, being relieved to retire. Just expand on sort of what you meant with that. Um, yeah, I wasn't enjoying it at all. Um, I wasn't enjoying the level I was playing at. I wasn't enjoying the everything you had to do to get your body right to to play at a level you didn't enjoy playing at. It was just, it was just horrible, and I was relieved in that sense. Now, at, in that moment of time, it was a relief to not be playing anymore. But when you measure it against earlier years. And you and you reflect in that way. It's you know it's quite sad, really. You do miss those days, but the point I was at at the end, I was well done and well past it. And um, as I said, I was relieved. Relieved it came to an end. And you said you know when you went part time and things, you had a bit more time to think about what maybe what was going to be next and and those things. The coaching ideas start to come in your mind. What was the first experience of coaching that made you think actually this is going to be for me? This is the way I want to go. Um. Well, funnily enough, we're still playing. It was Brett Pittman of all people who got all of us and said, I want to do my level two, which is the first badge we need to do. So myself, Warren Cummins, Alan Connell, Brett Pittman, and Steve Lovell at the time, and Danny Hollands. We all went to do our level two badges together. And, um, and it was a frustrating experience. It was drawn out, it was long. Um, and I still wasn't sure about it at that point, but um, it was when I went to watch Alan Connell and I saw him do it in a structured way, albeit they were very young. The kids were really intelligent. And I thought, wow, these boys can take on tactics. They they understand football um, and they were good players in it. I could see how much Al enjoyed it and I could see how good he was at it. And I could see how much the kids responded to the information he was giving them. And I just thought I'd like to have a go at it. So locally, Dan Neville, he runs Champion Sports. Uh, so I went and did a few sessions for him. It wasn't as good as academy level, but it was, um, it was still decent local players. And that's when I started really having room to exper uh, experiment and play around with it and start to figure out the type of coach I was going to be. Um, and then, of course, I spoke to Joe Roach and I came in and started working in the academy myself. And... I loved it from that point on. As soon as I started doing the under 13s in the, in the academy, I loved it. And um, the same group actually that I started with are going to go on to be first year scholars next year now. So it's quite a few of them boys that I was going to have next year as scholars. And to see them develop the way they have um, is really, really intriguing. It's really interesting. Uh, it's fascinating actually. But yeah, I absolutely loved it as soon as I started working in the academy. How different is it for you to coach under 12s, under 13s and then under 21s? The age, the the obvious, um, what am I trying to say? There's a, there's an innocence about the kids at that age. They all want to be the best player, um, but they will hang off your last word and they'll do anything you tell them to do. Whereas the older boys are a bit more temperamental. They're, they're young men and they're, they're experiencing so much more as people um, as well as as footballers. So you've got, to, you've got to get the balance right. You've got to understand the person first. And obviously it's full time, so it's, it's a daily... Um, interaction so you can form quite good relationships or quite close relationships to understand them before you start coaching them as a player you obviously don't get that close to the young to the young kids they just do as you do as you tell them really or do as they're told I should say um, but the challenge of, of coaching 
the older boys, is, like, as you say, they're, they're, they're close to first team football. So it's real, you can see the type of personalities and players they are. It's just trying to fine tune them and improve them on what they need improving or make them better at what it is they're good at, just to give them that final push. Um, so it's not a real clear answer there, but there are differences and there are similarities actually between the two. Having having Joe Roach at the head of the academy and Mark Molesley before and Brian Stock and Warren Cummings and Alan Connell, like you've said, it must help and encourage you having ex-teammates and, and particularly Joe who's been here a long time as well around you. Yeah, I think everybody's still got, um, still carries that feel that the club used to have when it was in League One and League Two. Um, it was a closeness, wasn't there? Because there was a struggle, more of a more of a different kind of struggle. So I think everybody that you've just mentioned kind of represents that era a little a little bit and tries to, you know, carry that message and carry that understanding of where the clubs come from to get to where it is today. Um, and obviously, I'm very I'm quite close with a lot of the people you've just mentioned. So we can all work together really easily. Not that we all sit there and just agree on everything, but that, the beauty of knowing them is that we can actually have conflict in opinions at times and, and find a way to, to improve. And I think that's massive. As well as that, we have a changed, had a change at the top this season and a new head coach comes in with his coaching staff as well. What, what was that like? I know that he's embraced your players and had them training with his first team a lot. What was that like for you? It didn't really impact what we do, to be honest. Obviously, Perch is still there and he's been a great point of contact between the two, uh, between the 21s and the first team. And I um, uh, spoke with Woody a couple of times about different things. He's so busy, as you can imagine, but he's been good as gold when I've spoken to him. Um, but from our perspective, nothing's really changed. It's just what whatever they need, we need to provide it for them. Um, so yeah, not not much really. Coaches often become managers. Is that something that you fancy next? That's a question I get asked often. Um, and so boring, questions, Neil. Same ones you get asked <laughs> all the time. <laughs> no, it is, it is a question I get asked often. And um, at the moment, no, I don't aspire to be that just yet. I always said, let me have five years at it and see where I'm at. Um, and I haven't had five years at it yet. <laughs> What you might touch on this earlier when you're talking about the development of the kids and the, 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 through to being sort of first year scholars. What's the most rewarding part of being an under 21 manager at a club like this? I think it's seeing players, I think it's relative because we know some players aren't going to be good enough for the first team. They're just never going to get there. Um, but they're good enough for A level. And I just think seeing progress and seeing, um, seeing them grow again as people for me that that's rewarding seeing them comfortable the ones who might be a little bit quiet to begin with who are comfortable to participate and um contribute to what the group are doing um and really work hard to to make themselves better i think that's that's as rewarding as seeing someone get into the first team uh to be honest is, is that a, i guess a, a realism of under 21 football that maybe people outside the structure aren't aware of is that for you guys, the reality is only a handful, two or three of your squad are going to get through to the first team. But actually, you still have to channel all of your efforts and your abilities as a coach into guys just shaping their individual careers for the next step they take. Once you've decided to give them a deal, you're saying, right, for the next year or two years, I'm going to give everything I've got. You Maybe you're not going to be good enough for the first team, but I will do everything I can to make you a better player. It's a bigger picture, maybe for you, than just getting people into the Bournemouth first team. Yeah, I think that's um, that's obviously the number one priority. We want to get players in the first team and create assets for the club, I guess. Um, but across the academy, the individualisation is the main focus. Um, so we have to take people, and I, I, I'm big on letting, not boxing players in, not making them something, letting them discover their identity and letting it flourish and really encouraging the best out of them. Um, and like I said earlier about Drisk, giving them room to fail in order to improve. Um, I, I'm really big on that. Um, so for for me, the individualization is massive and make each player the best they can be and hopefully they can go and do wherever they're going to end up. Is there a lot of Sean O'Driscoll and, and Eddie Howe and people in your coaching? I've definitely, yeah, they've affected the way I think about players and about football. Um, I don't necessarily mirror their 
techniques or the way they do things, but my some of my beliefs, I think, yeah, they stem from the way they made me think about it. What's the hardest part of being an under 21 coach at a championship club, maybe? Um, the hardest part, probably across all age groups, is letting players go. Um, it's, it's horrible, especially none of the players do enough to deserve it. There's never one you sit there and go, yeah, he deserves to go. They all work so hard to try and be the best they can be. And then, you know, you're the one who has to sit there and explain, not even explain, just have the conversation that I think it's best, blah, 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 and say what you need to say. It's horrible. It's, it's, it's tough. Just a last one on your, your current move before we uh, we round off with some fans question. Your, your current coaching situation. Obviously, there's talk in, in the, the pipeline and there's you know, work being done on the training ground and an academy and things which, you know, are still to be uh, d developed. But is the challenge still as big here for Bournemouth in this area in terms of recruitment and getting the best players in when you have Southampton down the road? I think Southampton have just been relegated from front Premier League 2, for example. They're under 23 setups having a bit of a, a tougher time. How have you found that recruitment has changed for Bournemouth, either from the Premier League to the Championship or in the area generally? Are players finding Bournemouth now or are you still having to reach out further to, to get the maybe the London players who don't make it at top clubs? Um, well, we have managed to in the last few years bring in some good lads at under 16 level or under 18 level uh, some of the boys around the first team now were lads we brought in Jaden and um, and obviously Jay-Z um, it's tough for us because of the category status we're still at um, so we are very much local lads and we do look for for the odd diamond in the rough who might be out there ready for us to to bring in um, so yeah that's that's a battle we, we're always going to have I think Let's finish with some fans' questions that have come in on, on social media for you, Coops. Um, Kevin Anderson on Twitter says, with the likes of uh, Jordan Zamura and Jaden Anthony getting a bit of first-team game time this season, you've already referred to how, sort of how you work with Jonathan Woodgate in, in those kind of selections. Do you push people forward, maybe via Stephen Purchase, to Jonathan Woodgate, or does he have them in regularly in training sessions and see it all for himself? Our boys have trained in front of Woodgate quite a lot since he's had the job, so he's aware of quite a lot of them. Um, obviously, lads who have done well previous, Perching knows them. And every game we play, they get they get feedback on all of it. So they're aware of the lads. They like the ones they like. Uh, and there's quite a few of our boys who you didn't mention there who've done well. So they're quite highly thought of. So yeah, he's aware our boys get a good opportunity to play in front of them, which it's not always the case. It wasn't always the case that so many of our lads would get time in front of the manager. Um, but now they do. So they've done pretty well. Mark Cole on Twitter asks, did you always want to get into coaching? Uh, no. In my early years, well, say my early years, up to the age of late 20s, I would have said, no, I don't want to coach. It's only when I started it, uh, when my career was coming to an end, that I realised how much I enjoyed it. The AFC Bournemouth fan page on Twitter is asking, have you preferred managing or playing, obviously very different things, but which one feels more rewarding? Uh, coaching. Coaching feels more rewarding for sure. I feel like seeing somebody else improve or seeing somebody else do well has always brought me more pleasure than doing well for myself, to be honest. So yeah, definitely coaching. John from the Isle of Wight is asking, is it true that your dad unearthed Simon Moore playing for Brading, who went on to become the only player from the Isle of Wight ever to have played in the Premier League? Um, I didn't know he was at Brading, but yeah, it is true. My old man um, saw him play and I think he got him a trial at Brentford at the time because um, he had a contact there. So, yes, it's true. it is true. This one's from Chris Temple from Gillingham. No, no, it's Paul O'Connor on Facebook, actually. I'm looking to improve my coaching. Do you have any advice? Paul O'Connor is one of my best mates. So um, <laughs> tell him tell him I'll give him a call and give him advice on better questions. Um, <laughs> but having said that, he's actually a really good gas engineer and plumber. So if anyone on the Isle of Wight needs anything done, he's, uh, he's very good. That's the plan. And maybe we should ask <laughs> Paul O'Connor this last question instead of you. What do you like to do outside of football? <laughs> Are you asking me that yeah, question? Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's a question. Um, I don't have time to do much else, to be honest. Um, I like to play golf. There you go. And I don't get to do it very often.
Um, <laughs> Paul O'Connor, gas and plumbing have had bigger, more plugs than dominoes today, which is saying something. Usually we get top dominoes in somewhere. Um, Coops, it, we're, we're well over an hour now. Um, it's been with your playing career, long history with Bournemouth, former captain, of course, your, your early days with Pompey, and now your, your current role here. It's been the, the, that's obviously the reason we got you on. There's so many different elements to talk about. Uh, it's been great to hear. Uh, everything that you've said about your your playing time, memories of 10 years ago in the playoffs. Uh, obviously, you're going to say you're confident the boys are going to pull it off over the... The first team boys are going to pull it off over the, the next couple of games and get to Wembley. That that they are. Yeah, let me give you this club script there. It says, yes, <laughs> yeah. they, yes they are. Yeah, yeah, they are. <laughs> they are, they will. Yeah, great stuff. Coops, thanks for joining us. It's absolutely you. fascinating. Thank you. There we go. That was the uh, Cherries under-21 coach, Sean Cooper. Great career, Neil, with the club. Such a long association uh, with the club and an inextricable link with the South uh, as well. And I think well, we've learned a lot, particularly the 10-year the anniversary of the playoffs, just going through that season as well. Coops admits himself, didn't he? doesn't necessarily remember all of it specifically, but lots of fans will have had their memories triggered by that, I'm sure. Well, definitely. Good and bad memories from that season, of course, 2010-2011. Eddie taking the team on from the Great Escape and then Lee Bradbury and Steve Fletcher taking it on to the playoffs. You know, two fantastically memorable games, albeit that the second one ended the way it did. But I'm sure that a lot of Bournemouth supporters will always remember that night at Huddersfield. As Sean Cooper said, you know, it was a high and a low at the, at the same time. And um, I'm sure Sean wouldn't, you know, play 240 games for the club. Then he had a little bit of a journeyman spell and he'd had enough, as he quite rightly said. But it's fascinating to watch him working now with the under-21s, given his knowledge there. And like you said, they've been so successful with two cups this season as well. Absolutely. Five-star ratings for the Cherries under-21s this year. Feel free to do the same if you are on your podcast provider. Thanks for all of the positive ratings of the at the pod so far. It does certainly help to keep myself and mainly Neil's ego pumped up sufficiently to keep turning up every month. Uh, we do appreciate all feedback though, as ever, good or bad. So drop us a note on the club socials with the hashtag AFCBpod with anything you'd like to hear more uh, or less of, unless it's Neil, in which case I really am up the creek just on my own. Our thanks again to Sean Cooper. Thanks to you as well, Neil Perrett. Thanks from me, Chris Temple, for listening to the official AFC Bournemouth podcast. Back soon.